rapidly moving towards a more financially beneficial and environmentally friendly solution to accomplish our mission of a robust circular plastic economy. Advances in technology will usher in durable plastics that are inexpensive, easy to break down and recycle. Today, we're gonna to hear from experts who will share what they're doing to help accomplish this mission. Our first speaker, John Torkelson, is a professor at Northwestern University. He served as director of NSF Materials Research Center, and also he served as the Associate Dean of Graduate Studies Research in the Engineering School. Our second presenter today is Dr. Nicholas Rohr. He is senior researcher at National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Biomaterials Development and Polymer Engineering in Golden, Colorado. And he is an expert in performance advantaged bioproducts focused on using the inherent functionality of biomass derived precursors to enable benefits in manufacturing, performance, and end of life. Our producer, Madison Long, will be monitoring the chat box. And if you have any questions during today's presentations, please put the questions in the chat box. When all the presenters have finished, we're gonna go to the chat box and we'll answer your questions at the end of uh, the final speaker. So if you'll welcome me, if you'll welcome me please join our first presenter, Professor John Torkelson. Uh, thank you very much. Um, good morning. Um, my research group has had a, a long-standing interest uh, in recycling of polymers. And in fact, we published our first paper with the word uh, recycling uh, uh, in it in 1999. Uh, there are good reasons uh, to have interest uh, in terms of polymer recycling. Annual worldwide production of polymers and plastics exceeds 800 billion pounds per year. That's more than 100 pounds per person uh, on the face of the earth. The U.S. plastics industry um, is responsible for nearly 1 million jobs and is actually the sixth largest industry in the U.S. Less than 10% of all polymers and plastics are effectively recycled. Um, and among all polymers or, and plastics, about 15 to 20 percent of them are cross-linked polymers or polymer networks, which we also call thermosets, uh, and zero percent uh, of thermosets are recycled for high-value products. So about six or seven years ago, my research group decided to take on the challenge of, of, of these non-recyclable thermosets and uh, trying to um, come up with uh, viable ways to actually develop cross-link polymer materials that could be effectively recycled with full property recovery. Uh, and then to do this in a very simple way that might involve one step or two step chemistry uh, so that it could be relatively easily commercialized. Uh, in terms of background, if you're, if you're not very familiar with what cross-link polymers are, a good illustration of a cross-link polymer composite would be a rubber tire, and pretty much everybody knows about the challenges associated with recycling those particular materials. In the U.S., where we do um, a relatively good job in terms of recycling, nobody does a great job, but on a, a relatively good basis, uh, uh, the majority of rubber tires are actually burned for energy. Um, uh, maybe 30% are turned into a fine rubber crumb that might be uh, added into uh, asphalt for very low value applications. And the remainder um, are still put into uh, tire dumps, landfills, or a loss to the environment. Um, and for us, the, the idea here is we'd like to take these cross-link materials, provide, uh, des design them in an appropriate way, provide a stimulus, which uh, uh, as I will be discussing today, uh, um, uh, in my examples, uh, would be just uh, an increase in temperature, causing the bonds, the, the network to come apart, allowing us to then reprocess the material, and then upon cooling, have the bonds actually relink and recover uh, properties uh, uh, in those cases. And then we would want to be able to do this a number of times uh, with a still good property recovery in these circumstances. Regarding dynamic covalent bonds, there are two types. One is dissociative, where the bonds actually come apart uh, uh, in these cases, and where you where you reduce cross-link density and you actually end up uh, reverting the cross-link materials to branched or linear chains. 
Uh, there's a second type of dynamic chemistry known as associative dynamic chemistry, uh, where there is actually just an exchange process. Theoretically, the cross-link density remains constant, but because of this exchange, the material is considered malleable, um, uh, and uh, and and uh, that can work. With the dissociative case, if the cross-links come apart, there is actually the ability for chains to slide past one another and for the reprocessing to take place. To produce effective reprocessable polymer networks, there need to be a sufficient uh, there needs to be a sufficient level of dynamic covalent bonds or structures. They need to be able to undergo network reconfiguration under uh, proper conditions. And we would like to have them exhibit recyclability comparable to thermoplastic materials, which would be things like linear polymer chains uh, uh, in these cases. Uh, so my group uh, over the past six or seven years uh, has developed and, and published work on uh, seven different uh, uh, dynamic chemistries. And today I want to uh, briefly describe results from three of these. One, we'll talk about a one-step controlled radical polymerization-based synthesis of networks and network composites um, that, uh, that uh, allow for reprocessability of networks and network composites. Um, uh, we'll also talk about uh, another approach involving a one-step free radical polymerization from monomers using a particular type of, of a dynamic bond for the crosslink. And then we'll complete work with, with work with, we just actually had published on Tuesday of this week, where we have come up with a very simple free radical reactive processing method to process virgin or spent linear uh, uh, low density polyethylene and high density polyethylene into upcycled um, polyethylene networks uh, using these dialkyl amino disulfide bonds. Um, so let's begin with the with the first example. And here um, we are sort of drawing an analogy to rubber tires. Rubber tires are often made from um, copolymers of styrene and butadiene. And here um, we are producing a material um, where we are reacting polybutadiene in this particular case, low molecular weight polybutadiene, just three kilograms per mole with styrene um, to make copolymers. We add in a small amount of a radical uh, initiator uh, and a very small amount of a molecule known as tempomethacrylate. This tempomethacrylate has a nitroxide radical on it and this, these nitroxide radicals are stable radicals. They don't react with each other but they do react with carbon-based radicals and they are reversible bonds. And so nitroxide-mediated polymerization has been around for about 30 years, uh, actually originated at Xerox. And this is uh, work that we published several years ago, really bringing it into the realm of dynamic chemistry for polymer networks. And the idea is we can end up uh, taking these materials, you can see uh, in the, um, a sort of burnt orange uh, test tube where it says flowable liquid. This is prior to actually doing reaction. And after we do reaction, you see that we have a solid that's produced in that particular network. If we heat that solid up to 120 degrees C or higher, uh, the, uh, there is actually a dissociation of nitroxide carbon bonds uh, in that case. And we can reprocess the material and upon cooling, uh, we actually recover the cross-link density in these cases. So here we illustrate this case where we'd start off with the copolymer, we cut it into bits, and we can actually process this into films at 140 degrees C. Um, you see elastic character associated with these films. We can take those films, cut them into bits again, reprocess them, and actually recover uh, the elastic behavior associated with these. We can easily um, characterize cross-link density uh, in these materials by measuring uh, basically what would be the tensile modulus uh, or stiffness uh, of these materials as a function of temperature. And in the rubbery plateau region, uh, the, the value of the, of the modulus or the stiffness is actually proportional to the cross-link density. Uh, we know that this is work uh, that was uh, actually established uh, decades ago by uh, Flory uh, in his ideal rubber elasticity theory. 
And so we're simply measuring the rubbery plateau modulus in these cases you see as a function of as synthesized and molding and remolding in these cases. And with an experimental error, we end up getting a very good recovery associated uh, with uh, the modulus, meaning that we get very good recovery of cross-link density after reprocessing in these cases. Uh, here we show an example where we actually have 28% carbon black in the system. Um, we obtained material, a, a, a major tire manufacturer saw what we were doing and they provided us material where, where um, they had cis polyisoprene, which is actually natural rubber before you cross-link it. They had added in 28% carbon black and dispersed it well. Uh, uh, and, and then we did our reactions with this. And you see here again, in terms of a rubbery plateau modulus, we end up getting a very good uh, reproduction as a function of reprocessing. Um, <clears throat> That work um, um, was a case where we were doing reactions of polymer and monomer in terms of making these particular materials. We also have approaches where this can work if you're just making the networks from monomer and turning, doing with that reaction actually the production of the network and then uh, showing that that network can be reprocessed. So here we use um, an approach where we use um, dialkyl amino disulfide bonds, and I'm, I'm using my arrow here to, to draw a circle around those. Those linkages uh, actually have very good dynamic character where they will dissociate again at elevated temperature, but be very robust bonds at, at, at lower temperature in these particular cases. And we can uh, basically put this cross-linker uh, uh, between two carbon-carbon double bonds. This then by temps methacrylate molecule will effectively work as our cross-linker if we are reacting this with monomer that has a single carbon-carbon double bond. We do free radical polymerization in these cases and then end up making a network in these circumstances. This particular network we can reprocess at 130 degrees C uh, uh, and uh, make into new materials. Uh, so the idea here is we do our reaction of hexyl methacrylate with bitemps methacrylate, about five weight percent of bitemps methacrylate in the system. We add a radical initiator, just do free radical polymerization, but because there are two carbon-carbon double bonds here, we actually make a network. Uh, and then we can reprocess this network at 130 degrees C. The uh, dialkylamine disulfide bonds come apart. Um, leaving a branched uh, system, we can reprocess that and then upon cooling it returns to the network in this particular case. This material here we show again uh, looking at modulus as a function of temperature in these cases in the rubbery plateau region we end up with excellent reproduction uh, of the modulus as a function of remolding um, uh, uh, in these cases again showing that we get uh, excellent a recovery of cross-link density in these systems as a function of remolding. In the last case I want to illustrate is, is on this work that we just had published on Tuesday of this week, where we can take polyethylene, um, which is a, a linear polymer if it's high density polyethylene, or it's a branch polymer if it's low density polyethylene. And whether it's virgin material or it's waste uh, material, we can actually do simple one-step um, reactive processing on this particular material and turn it into dynamic covalent polyethylene networks that exhibit robust properties associated with cross-link polyethylene over a range of low temperatures. And then at high temperatures, uh, we can reprocess the materials and actually recover those particular properties. So we, we take advantage actually of the dialkyl amino disulfide bonds that we had used in the previous case, the bitemps methacrylate molecule, and we can uh, take low density polyethylene or high density polyethylene, add one weight percent of a radical initiator in that system with five weight percent of the bitemps methacrylate um, uh, and actually, uh, yes, and actually in this particular case, then do uh, reactive processing under these particular circumstances and obtain a cross-link network in this particular case. Um, so um, very simple reaction and here you see uh, what we obtain in this particular circumstance in terms of the 
the the the material coming out of the mixer in in this in this particular circumstance we can take that material and reprocess it 160 degrees c and press it into a nice film you can cut it into bits and reprocess it a number of times in these particular circumstances um we um know uh based on spectroscopy that we actually have uh this bi temps methacrylate linked uh, in as the linkers in these crosslink systems. So we've done work where we've removed any linear material uh, in the in in the system after doing the crosslinking by using um, soxlet extraction to remove the sol fraction and just to characterize what's there in in the crosslink systems. Uh, and we have uh, characteristics here associated with uh, the bi temps methacrylate in these systems. Uh, we uh, also know that. Um, um, at the present time, permanently cross-linked polyethylene is actually made by reactive processing where a radical initiator is added in to linear or branched polyethylene and they just make uh, these permanently cross-linked networks. Um, in those particular cases, with if, if we do the same thing with our linear, uh, with our low density polyethylene, we come up with 61% gel content. If we make our uh, dynamic covalent polymer networks with low density polyethylene, it's 68 weight percent uh, gel content. For the high density polyethylene system, whether we're making the permanently cross linked case uh, or we're making the dynamically covalently cross linked case, the gel content is about 95 to 97 percent. The, these materials, again, we can actually characterize in terms of cross link density in these particular cases. Um, uh, and here we illustrate uh, the excellent um, reproduction associated with these systems. We also show the case of the neat uh, low-density polyethylene and the neat high-density polyethylene, which don't exhibit any rubbery plateau modulus, and that's because the materials are not cross-linked. Once they go through their melt uh, transition, they actually just flow. Uh, but the cross-linked materials that are dynamically cross-linked uh, actually show the rubbery plateau and as a function of reprocessing in these cases, we get excellent reproduction associated with the modulus. These particular results are actually for virgin uh, polyethylene materials, but we have also done work uh, using waste materials, actually obtaining uh, plastic grocery bags from a grocery store, that's low density polyethylene, and going to a grocery store and buying a gallon uh, of milk and the milk jug is high density polyethylene and we obtain uh, uh, very similar results for the waste materials in those particular cases as well. Uh, and so this is a circumstance where, where this can work with virgin or with waste materials in terms of upcycling these particular um, uh, thermoplastic materials into higher value um, uh, network materials but these networks can actually be reprocessed multiple times. We also illustrate here that the crystallinity levels and the melting uh, peak uh, characteristics are also uh, highly reproducible uh, as a function of molding cycle in these particular cases. Uh, and so these can stand up robustly uh, to being reprocessed uh, multiple times uh, without uh, any loss in terms of their structure or in terms of the, the properties associated with the crosslinks. So with this, I'd like to finish by summarizing here that, that my group has worked on a variety of systems. I didn't have time today to talk about some of them, but we have uh, worked done a lot of work on polyurethane and non-isocyanate uh, uh, types of, of polyurethane networks and, and have had great success uh, with those particular cases as well. And it, it is possible these days to actually um, come up with um, highly recyclable versions of what have long been non-recyclable cross-link polymer thermosets and where you can reprocess these materials multiple times obtain full recovery of cross-link density and associated properties in those systems. Um, the cases I talked about today uh, would be polymer network types that are considered to be addition type polymer networks where you do the reactions using free radical polymerization. But of course, there are many types of important 
uh, condensation or step growth type polymer networks as well, such as polyurethane foams um, that, that are actually polymer networks and that uh, people are very interested in terms of the development of, of recyclable materials in those cases. And finally, uh, I'd like to uh, just conclude here in terms of saying that um, the effective chemical, chemical recycling of these traditionally non-recyclable polymer thermosets uh, we believe can, can contribute in a meaningful way to major advances in polymer su sustainability and the development of a circular economy associated with these cases. And, and if you're interested in terms of more information, I've listed some uh, publications here, but you can also send an email to me uh, and I will respond uh, over the weekend or early next week uh, with further information. And with that, uh, I want to thank you very much for your attention. And uh, after the second presentation or the third presentation, I'll be happy to uh, address questions as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Torkelson. Again, the chat box is open. So if you have questions or comments, uh, please put them there. And at the conclusion of our presentations, we will go to Q&A. Now let's welcome our next presenter, Dr. Nicholas Rohr, Senior Researcher at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Golden, Colorado, where it's not snowing, uh, but I'm sure it will be very soon. Perfect. Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to uh, dive right in because I have a lot of slides. I might skip around, might go fast. So I'm used, uh, I usually talk fast. So apologies in advance for that. But thank you, TA, for the opportunity to talk about our work today. Uh, and thank you for the introduction. As was said, my name is Nick Rohr. You can just call me Nick. I use he, him pronouns. And I'm a senior researcher at NREL. And I'm going to be talking a lot today about our work on thermosets from bio-derived resources. Um, specifically, you know, in my abstract, I have the title Towards a Better Steel Replacement, and that has a lot of uh, inspiration on how we approach a lot of our work. But if you think of my talk about anything, it's biomass and performance advantages for thermoset applications, or since I'm talking at TA today, I'm probably going to be talking a lot about how we use TA instruments to do a lot of our work. Um, so before I dive too deep into the talk itself, I want to give my acknowledgments up front in case I run out of time. A lot of my funding comes from the Bioenergy Technologies Office or the Vehicles Technologies Office, as well as NREL funded programs themselves. I also want to thank the people who've done a lot of this work. I am not allowed in lab anymore. I think Eric is on the line. He is in the middle of the slide. Uh, he does a lot of the work on CFRCs. And then Caroline Hoyt, who is one of our former postdocs, does a lot of work that I'm going to be talking about with benzoxazine resins. Also, another shout out, I get to work with an interdisciplinary team at NREL, which is really awesome. Uh, we get access to these unique monomers because we're mostly using kind of bio-derived resources for a lot of our work. And with that being said, kind of giving a little bit more context of the work that NREL does, because I have found in my talks that NREL historically is not known as a polymers lab. Um, what we do is we are taking a holistic approach to the conversion of biomass. So we are trying to take biomass and convert all parts of it, be it its cellulose, its hemicellulose, its lignin, into fuels and chemicals. And why we are doing this is we're doing this kind of mimicking a petrochemical refinery. So in petrochemical refineries, we're using all parts of the petrochemical uh, stream to make fuels and chemicals to really enable the economics. And that's kind of what we believe at NREL. So right now, as you all might have seen, there's a big push to make sustainable aviation fuels. Those might come from your cellulose or hemocellulose, but you're still left with things like lignin uh, to do a lot of work with. So at NREL, historically, we started with making um, materials kind of based off of direct replacement chemicals. So could we make a dipic acid from biomass? Could we make terephthalic acid from biomass? So on and so forth. But then we started to say, hey, instead of stripping away all that functionality from these bio-derived resources, could we actually um, use that inherent functionality to make materials that might have better properties than their incumbent materials, be it in manufacturing the material. So can we make things that are faster cure times, lower GHG emissions, so, so on and so forth performance of the material or at the end of life? Can we make things like Professor Torkelson talked about, recycled by design, so on and so forth. And so I'm gonna skip a couple slides just in the interest of time here. But when we look at the inherent functionality of biomass, we start to find a lot of natural products that we can target. So what I've tossed up on this slide is what we call a Van Krevlin diagram. Typically, Van Krevlin diagrams are used in the petrochemical industry to say what you can use a given stream. Um, to do. But here you can show a Van Krevlin diagram 
of the header atom functionality of a material, so this X to C ratio on the X axis, versus the hydrocarbon functionality of a material. And you can plot, you know, all of today's plastics, so polyurethanes, nylon 66, epoxy resins, uh, so on and so forth, versus today's incumbent materials, or versus, you know, our biodrive feedstock, so sugar, lignin monomers, and all that stuff. And one of the things you see on this slide is when you look at how far a bio-based feedstock is from a material of interest, the bio-based feedstocks are a lot closer to kind of these performance polymers that we think about, the polycarbons, the polyurethanes, the epoxy resins, than they are to things like polyethylene. Polyethylene, polystyrene, so on and so forth are a lot closer to BTX, right? Benzene, toluene, and xylene, one of these typical feedstocks that we use in petrochemical manufacturing. So for us, it makes a lot of sense to go after, you know, these high heteratom materials uh, that we see around today. And some of these high heteratom materials are some of my favorite materials thermosets. So I'm going to click two more slides real quick. Um, and talk really about thermosets. So thermosets are an amazing material, right? Uh, we use them in wind turbine blades. We use them for structural support. They have great material properties and they're used in a lot of energy relevant applications. Also as the shout out, I am from Colorado. So they're also used in a lot of recreational applications such as snowboards here shown on the left. Um, and so they are high life material, long life materials with great robust and tunable properties. Despite all this, thermosets themselves can only be used for one life. I mean, I'm going to talk today about how we can use these materials for more than one life. Uh, you saw some of the work from Professor Tolkison talk about uh, other materials for more than one life. But these materials themselves uh, have a lot of uses and <laughs> have a lot of uses, but can only be used for one life of the material itself. And so thus that kind of represents, you know, a lot of GHG emissions as you manufacture more and more of these materials, so on and so forth, and really reflects an unsustainable energy economy. So our approach at NREL in our work is to say, how can we tackle this kind of unsustainable energy economy to make materials that have better performance or lower GHG emissions or recycled by design compared to their petrochemical incumbents? So I'm gonna go through, this says three and a half stories. Usually when I give this talk, it's three and a half stories. I'm gonna go through two quick stories of work we've done at our lab on kind of benzoxazine resins uh, and how we can at least make the manufacturing of those resins more efficient and on recycled by design uh, carbon fiber composites and how we can reuse those materials over multiple lives to get a lot of processing benefits and all that good jazz. So diving right in, I want to talk about kind of amines and benzoxazine resins, or really naphthoxazine resins themselves. Um, so I'm just going to go right along. So naphthoxazine resins often use an amine-based precursor in their manufacture. And amines, when we make them from petrochemical resources, use a lot of supply chain energy and emit a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. What you can see here kind of on these tables are life cycle analysis or supply chain analysis that we've done at NREL for petrochemical based amines such as benzene diamine and hexamethylene diamine. And you see that these materials use a lot of supply chain energy in their manufacture and emit a lot of greenhouse gas emissions in their manufacture. Versus if you can make a bio-based amine, you can get dramatic reductions in the supply chain energy and in the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Additionally, when you use bio-based amines, they are cost competitive or near cost competitive with today's typical amines from manufacturer because amines themselves are expensive to make. So here's an old slide, but analysis we've done on amines is that you can make them for about $2.70 per kilogram of material themselves. So this kind of analysis has motivated us at NREL to look into a lot of materials themselves uh, that are amine based, such as naphthoxazine resins. So naphthoxazine resins themselves are really cool materials because naphthoxazines can often possess a higher glass transition temperature than the cure temperature of their material. And typically we make naphthoxazine resins by taking something like naphthol and condensing it with aniline to make a naphthoxazine, which you see here on the far right label 2B. You apply heat to this material, it ring opens across that 
uh, strained uh, cyclic middle part of the thing. I'm an engineer, not a chemist. Uh, and that shows up some days. And we can make robust materials. The problem with naphthoxazine resins today in their manufacture is that they often have to use really high cure temperatures that often lead to extra equipment costs and extra manufacturing costs and can lead to part defects because you're often operating at a high temperature. So within this world, it would be best if we could actually lower the cure temperature of these materials. And how we've proposed doing that is with this catalytic moiety uh, that we can find from biomass. So here we can um, take this uh, four aminophenyl acetic acid and we can make our own naphthoxazine out of it. And the big difference is it has this carboxylic acid, which might lead to enhanced performance. So one of our postdocs, Caroline Hoyt, she made a bunch of these materials and she showed that she can make this and she can make the petrochemical based naphthoxazine and then she could cure them and make materials. So what Caroline did is once she made these materials, sorry, I keep clicking my arrow instead of in the platform itself. She made these materials and she tossed them on a DSC to see what their cure is. So the blue dotted line here is a typical petrochemical naphthoxazine resin. And what you see here is that you slowly heat up this material itself. And then eventually once you get around 250 C, it will go through the cure um, and it will have an exotherm, it will complete the cure, so on and so forth. When we make our bio-derived, so this little 2A, which is shown in the red line, uh, naphthoxazine resin, what we can see is you heat up this material, it goes through a melting transition, and then immediately after that melting transition, it will go through an exotherm and it will cure, and this material from the bio-derived resource will complete its cure before the petrochemical derived material has even started its cure, which this itself is really awesome, right? However, a lot of work we do at NRAIL is with actually manufacturing composites. The disadvantage to this system is that, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. The disadvantage to the system, which we will talk about shortly, is that this is a solid and you have to melt the solid. So we still have to find ways around that. But one of the things that Caroline did first is we said, hey, we have these two materials on the bottom here. You see our naphthoxazine-based resin. On the top here, you see our bio-derived naphthoxazine resin with its catalytic moiety. What Caroline did, did this on the DSC once again, studied the conversion as a function of time at a temperature of 150 C. And she showed that when you have your bio-derived resin, you slowly can get complete conversion of your material in under two hours. When you take your petrochemical uh, reaction and you add propionic acid, so it looks like this biodrive resin, you can get your cure to complete within two hours. So it is this catalytic moiety versus the petrochemical material itself doesn't cure. Where I was getting ahead of myself on the last slide is that, as I said, this 2A material, this biodrive naphthoxazine is a solid. So it's not ideal for applications, but we can use this as an additive in the petrochemical derived material, and we can lower the temperature of cure for the petrochemical derived material. So here in the dotted black line, you see the data you saw on the previous slide, same with the dotted pink line. And these exotherms that you see in between the material are us slowly adding in this catalytic, catalytic naphthoxazine and dramatically reducing the cure temperature of the material. So here we've shown that we can leverage the bio-derived functionality of a material to reduce its cure temperature uh, and thus have benefits in manufacturing. NREL is an interdisciplinary lab. We get to do a lot of LCA and TEA. Our colleague, Avantika Singh, she then took all this. She took the heat flow that was required throughout this uh, whole cure process. And what we've showed is that as you get reductions in the cure temperature for these naphthoxazine resins, so looking at the graphs on the right, you can get dramatic reductions in the amount of energy that you need to operate this process. So thus you should get savings in energy, greenhouse gas emissions and costs to actually ultimately manufacture uh, these materials itself simply by lowering its cure temperature by using bio-derived resources. So that was the first story very quickly done uh, showing how we extensively used our DSC to uh, show that we can get performance advantage in uh, naphthoxazine-based thermosets. The problem with naphthoxazines is I'm sure there's work out there, but they are not inherently recyclable by design. And that is something that we are intensely uh, interested in at NRAIL. And so one of the other things that we've been looking at is saying, hey, can we make CFRCs and can we make them recyclable by design? And 
So what we've said at InRail is, can we take biodrive precursors, uh, such as epoxies and anhydrides, and can we make an infusible resin, infuse it into glass or carbon fiber, make a part, and then thermoform that part using these kind of exchangeable networks that John mentioned in the previous talk, depolymerize the resin itself, and recover the fiber to actually enable circularity over multiple lives. And that's exactly what we've done. And by what we've done, I mean the people who work in the lab, such as Eric, uh, have done throughout their work. So at NREL, we've taken this biodrived kind of mixture of asorbidol, polyglycidyl ether, a butane diol, diglycidyl ether, and this anhydride-based monomer, which can come from multiple biodrived constituents, such as isoprenum leak and hydride is specifically at how we can do this. And can we make a CFRC? So the work that we've done is we've developed an infusible resin of these components, infuse them into fiberglass and carbon fiber, and subject them into cure to make these things that we call polyester covalently adaptable networks. Uh, the joke at NREL is we call these things pecans, and that is because our tech manager calls them pecans, and when the person who funds your research finds a clever name for materials, you lean hard into it. And so that's exactly what we've done. And so what we have done at NREL is we've form formulated this polyester covalently adaptable network that has material properties to rival epoxy aiming carbon fiber reinforced composites. So what you see here on the right and what you'll see kind of for the rest of my a uh, quick talk is kind of the typical things we do at NREL where we plot our data on a spider chart, where being on the outside of the spider chart is good, being on the inside is less desirable. So when we make a pecan-based carbon fiber reinforced composite, you can see that we have a low density, high strength to weight ratio material, and a material with moderate elongations that break. Meanwhile, when we make an epoxy aiming carbon fiber reinforced composite, we can still get a lightweight material with high strength to weight ratios and a slightly more brittle material. Now, the big thing to note here is that CFRCs themselves are aimed to be used as replacements for steel. And so you can see that our CFRCs still don't perform as well as steel. And so here's where we're gonna get into that first part of our talk. But the big thing to note is we've been able to show that we can redesign from biodebased derived resources, a resin from polyesters that looks and performs a lot like an epoxy amine resin. The big thing though is we now have polyesters in the backbone of this material. So we can do something like simple, submit this to methanolysis, and we can depolymerize the resin to yield monomers such as the dimethyl ester and a mixture of polyols and reclaim our carbon fiber reinforced composite, which is something that you can't easily do. There's a lot of work being done, but you can't easily do with epoxy amine resins themselves. So we've shown that we can depolymerize our resin. We can polymerize it to have properties such as epoxy amine CFRCs. What else can we do with this recyclable by design resin? Well, we can reuse that fiber over multiple lives. So this is work that I did not do, but was done in our lab. Here you see DMA, which is definitely the major work uh, horse of our lab itself. And you see that on the first life of these materials, we have materials with great storage modulus, wonderful plateau modulus, and moderate glass transition temperatures around 76 C. We can then take our fiber, reinfuse it with virgin resin, and on the second life of our material, we can still get excellent performance. In fact, we actually see some increases to the glass transition temperature of the material and the storage modulus. We're redoing this data currently for a publication, or at least that's what we talked about yesterday. But we hypothesize here that you know we're effectively sizing our fibers throughout the depolymerization process, which is why we get better performance kind of in the second and third life relative to the first life. So we've shown through this approach through redesign using bio-based monomers that we can reuse these materials over for multiple lives themselves. Also, you know, John gave a great preamble to this talk. These epoxy and hydride chemistries or these polyester covalently adaptable networks can rearrange their ne network topology. So we can also take our CFRC panels, which are a flat panel, and we can thermoform them into different shapes. So here we kind of made this wonderful prototypical part that has a bunch of different geometries, and we can thermoform our material into a bunch of different shapes by virtue of this covalently adaptable network, which is really valuable for the vehicles industry where you're trying to make cars of different shapes and sizes. So we've shown that we can press this material into multiple shapes uh, themselves. Also, we've shown that 
the material itself, the redesigned material, has better impact energy than the epoxy amine baseline. And when you thermoform the material, like in the vehicles industry itself, you can get better uh, impact energy itself. So I both showed you in the second part of this talk that we're able to redesign materials uh, using bio-based materials to be recycled by design and have better performance. NREL is an analysis-driven lab. So the last kind of thing I want to shout out here is that you know we can also make our resins that are near cost competitive with today's petrochemical epoxy amine resins themselves. Once again, you see a spider chart. So on this middle figure is a spider chart for the first life of this material. And you see that we have low density, high strength to weight ratio materials and low elongation at break. Um, However, our materials, since they're using carbon fiber, which is really energy intense, on the first life of these materials, their GHG emissions are comparable with steel and their cost is a lot higher than steel on a volumetric basis. When we take these materials, we depolymerize the resin and we start using these materials for more than one life. Uh, you can actually have a material that is decarbonized relative to steel when you have a material that you can use over two plus lives and actually for that second life of the material ends up costing less than steel on a volumetric basis which is really important because that's how we uh, do our accounting going to skip past the slide real quick because i know i'm running short on time but as i kind of started the second part of the talk saying we're trying to make a better steel replacement right we want to use carbon fiber reinforced composites in place of steel so how can we find ways to actually improve you know our ductility of the material the elongation of the brake to make these materials more competitive with steel itself and there's a bunch of ways to do this we can look into using different fibers so on the left is our carbon fiber composite that i've shown you before on the middle we make a polyethylene based composite so we use polyethylene as our reinforcement you see that uh, when we compare our storage modulus to the weight ratio here, we take a huge hit, but we're increasing the elongation break of these materials at themselves. You can use Kevlar itself, doesn't really get the benefits, at least in this application, compared to carbon fiber. We can also reformulate our resin, so we can add in more thermoplastic characteristic to increase its elongation at break, which is what you see here at the left. I know I'm going really fast, but I think I'm running short on time, and even though we might not have the third speaker, I want to be respectful of everyone's time itself or we can add in additives. Uh, and here we can show that when we add in various additives, we can look at the tan delta of the material and we can get no degradation in performance, showing that we actually have a really robust resin. So with all that being said, I hope I've shown you in the second story that what we can do at InRail is by redesigning and reformulating uh, resins through performance, uh, through biodirect resources, we can make materials that are not only competitive or outperform today's standard epoxy amine uh, materials, but we can make materials themselves that have um, performance starting to, towards what we desire, such as a steel replacement itself. Um, so yeah, I hope that I have at least shown you that thermosets are a great area to start looking at uh, bio-derived resources and leveraging their inherent functionality to make materials with robust performance itself across manufacturing performance and end of life. And I hope I've shown you that we have extensively used TA instruments to do a lot of these characterizations. Either way, I yield the floor back to the moderator and any questions. Thank you all for your time today. Thank you, Nick. Excellent job. It's great to have you here today. As uh, uh, Professor alluded to, uh, Professor Dorgan is not able to join us today. So we're going to go ahead and move right into our question and answers part of today's webinar. If you have questions that you would like to get answered, please use the chat box and our moderators will take care of that. Professor Torkelson, if you could return to the stage and turn your camera back on, then we're going to go ahead and move into our first question today. Um, OK, so I think my camera is on at least. That, that's what it says to me. So hopefully you can <laughs> that's a see good me. Sign. Yeah, so our first question is for you. Uh, the PE upcycling work is interesting. Do you have a pathway forward to scale it up? And would the reaction rate allow it to go through an extrusion process at some larger scale processing technique? Yes, yeah, so, um, so that's a very important question, I think. Um, um, so, so we ended up making use of, of uh, compression molding equipment for doing the reprocessing because we're in a university environment where small scale equipment is, is, is what we have to work with. However, 
Um, we did the reactive mixing uh, with that in terms of a, a, a process that has actually um, been shown uh, to be um, uh, 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 an effective substitute uh, for, for things like a twin screw extruder. Now, the time scales associated with our process for what we have currently done are too long in terms of a typical twin screw extruder operation uh, uh, with the temperatures we'd have employed. Um, we are interacting um, with uh, industry on this and in fact have sent a couple of our students um, uh, to spend the better part of a week at a company and, uh, uh, and, and do some work there. And uh, there are indications there uh, from that work that uh, by going to somewhat higher temperature, um, uh, we can actually end up doing things in, in terms of an extrusion type of apparatus. We are also doing some things in terms of making sort of minor modifications on the crosslinker uh, so that the dissociation uh, is, is, uh, is, is, is more robust uh, uh, at, at temperatures, allowing us uh, to, um, to actually uh, reduce the viscosity uh, significantly and get that uh, uh, into something that would be uh, handled at, uh, at, 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 at a relatively rapid clip in terms of something like twin screw extrusion. These are, these are very important issues, I think, for the future commercialization uh, of these particular cases. But the results we've seen so far uh, appear to be promising. Um, uh, and I think it will be absolutely vital that uh, universities or national labs uh, uh, interact with, with industry that may be set up uh, well in terms of being able to uh, take advantage of, of the background we have, uh, refine it further and commercialize it. Well, great. Thank you for that. Um, we do have other questions in the chat. So I guess, Dr. Nick, we're going to roll over to you. Uh, you had a great story about the pecan uh, CFRC. Um, the question is, what was the cure temperature? And time. Yeah, you so I really like that question for multiple reasons. So for we've studied the cure of these materials uh, as a function of temperature for a lot of things. We did the cure temperature of these materials at 80 C. Um, we're diving actually more and more into the cure because as uh, John was just talking about, as you scale up, that becomes a big thing. And so one of the things we're learning about at NRAIL is like when you're going to win the application, you can't go above 100 C in the cure. So we can do the cure a lot faster if we go to 100 C. Um, but uh, we can't have the exotherm go above that because of tooling. So ADC is our cure temperature, which is actually leading us to reformulate some of our resins themselves uh, is the short answer to that question. <laughs> uh, but I think it's really insightful. And the other thing I wanted to shout out about that and why I kind of picked that as my first question to answer is one of the benefits as well as these kind of pecan resins or these epoxy and hydride resins is they're kind of a very high contrast chemistry. So when you're infusing a... Uh, carbon fiber or really any reinforced composites, you have to make sure you have a balance of pot life and cure kinetics. And so these materials, they don't cure as fast as epoxy amines, but they do actually have a longer pot life because it's a really high contrast chemistry. So it doesn't really actually start taking off until you hit ADC. So that's kind of another benefit of these materials that I just wanted to toss in while I had the floor. Well done. Uh, our next question, um, I think, is for Professor Torkelson. It's from Daniel Grunenberg. He wants to say thank you for the interesting talk. How about the cost of such materials? Are they economically competitive? Uh, so that's a, a very good question. Um, so for, for much of what we uh, uh, end up doing, the major components uh, in our materials are actually the materials um, um, that that would be uh, um, currently employed in terms of making those networks. And so, uh, so we're doing very little uh, in terms of adding cost in those cases. For example, in the case of the polyethylene networks that we end up making, um, polyethylene networks are currently made by reacting polyethylene with dicumyl peroxide in a reactive process. Uh, in our particular case, we take polyethylene and react it with dicumyl peroxide plus a little bit of this bitemps methacrylate molecule added into the system. And that little bit, the work I showed you here was five weight percent, but we've also done some other studies uh, where it's a fraction of the five weight percent and it still ends up providing 
robust properties, in fact, in some cases, even higher cross-link densities. Uh, uh, and so, um, uh, so those are cases where um, it potentially adds pennies uh, to, to the cost of, of the particular material. Um, um, we've also done uh, quite a bit of work um, uh, on other cases where, um, uh, like Nick, we are interested in terms of things that, that may be bio-based. And, and, and in some circumstances, we've done work with relatively inexpensive non-food bio-based materials uh, uh, in terms of getting those uh, actually to, to lead to very robust uh, properties as well. So I think this can be done in a circumstance where the uh, cost is um, is is very close to that of commercial materials that don't have uh, the re reprocessability or recyclability uh, that these materials have. And in the end, then that means these materials will will actually have the potential to be much less expensive as they get reused and reprocessed multiple times. That sounds great. Good news, right? Looks like we are back uh, yes. to Dr. Yes. Nick. So pe people are interested in sustainability, but it's also got to be economically feasible. If it's not, yeah. um, that will be a major problem. Yeah, and a bit of a conundrum, right? Because uh, the, the rapid large-scale adoption helps to bring price down on normally speaking. Exactly, right? exactly. Yeah. So we're back to you, Dr. Nick. Uh, looks like we've got um, some. Okay, Professor Rohr showed his uh, last slides. How come? the addition of fillers such as glass or calcium carbonate does not affect the tan delta curve obtained by DMA? I had a better answer to this question when I selected it, but uh, <laughs> I think uh, it's spaced me a little then, but I think it's because we're still making a tan delta is mostly, you know, the lot the ratio of the storage and loss modulus. And so we're still maintaining the same thermal transitions uh, throughout these regions. But it's also just showing that the fillers that we've put in, so aluminum trihydrate, which is really great because it's for flame retardancy, so great for vehicle applications, calcium carbonate, just reducing cost. Um, and there was a third one in there, but oh, glass beads. It's showing that we still have, as far as the composite goes or a resin, we still have great uh, compatibility across the whole material itself. And it's just still very robust. So we're not seeing like, you know, any additional loss modulus because you're starting to have interfacial losses. It's really just showing a compatibilized and homogenized blend, uh, which is why at least we're postulating that. And we have more hypotheses when you actually start looking at the uh, chemistry of the material of why it starts to look better. The chemistry of these resultant thermosets is really weird. We have both like aliphatic characteristic, hydroxyl characteristic. We clearly don't have aromatic characteristic, but we kind of have this mixed functionality uh, that kind of might be leading to these materials to be a little bit, this is a wrong use of the term, but amphiphilic. And so really compatible with a wide variety of materials themselves. And so that's kind of why we're saying we have great uh, compatibility regardless of the filler. So I hope I answered great. that well. Uh, let's see. Our next question is also for you. Uh, so let's stay with you, Nick. Um, okay. Levi Hammernick wants to know um, about the oxanine work and why you are using um, the petroleum sourced products instead of the bio derived phenols. That's a good question that I don't have a good answer to. Uh, I know Caroline started the work uh, with some of the phenols and then made the naphthols, and I think it was just a more stable, uh, easy thing to work with. But I wish I had a better answer to that, except I will say, you know, it's a great question because we can use uh, bio-derived phenols or bio-derived, just let's say, aromatic uh, OHs, right? So there's more opportunity in that work to exploit that itself. I think really the big thing, and this is whenever I go give talks at universities, uh, which I'm always willing to go give talks at universities, but whenever I go give talks at universities, the one thing I always say is like, if you want to be a really strong postdoc candidate at a place like InRail, know how to do a proper control reaction. So we want to always compare our materials to some petrochemical baseline material, some material that's always already out there in the industry. So naphthoxazine resins are already out there and we want to control what we change. So we start with the naphthoxazine based on aniline and naphthol, and then we throw in our biodrived amine that now has this catalytic moiety. So, you know, I think maybe the better answer to that question than the one I started with is that would be a perfect next evolution of this is now that we've shown that we can get that catalytic performance, what happens if we take it one step further and add in a biodrived uh, phenol of some sort? So excellent question. And I'm glad right. I got to put your answer. We are back to are Professor Torkelson. 
And this is from Mark Hindenling. He wants to know what types of industrial applications do you see being applied to first? Or do you see these being applied to first? Well, I think there um, uh, is is actually very significant potential associated with the polyethylene networks uh, that we've been that we've been making, and so they um, are uh, heavily employed and have been for uh, some decades in a variety of applications. Um, uh, I don't know all of them, but uh, they are uh, heavily employed in terms of uh, piping applications uh, for uh, things like uh, natural gas or for plumbing. They're also used as insulation for uh, for electrical wiring and cable uh, and uh, and a number of other applications. And um, uh, and then I think there are also circumstances um, where where uh, these materials um, may may as well be able to replace uh, thermoplastic materials where there might be some interest in terms of um, higher temperature creep resistance because the because of the dynamic crosslinks being there, but then also allowing for reprocessability in those cases. Um, we're also doing a lot of work um, on, uh, on polyurethane or polyurethane-like materials, and there's a tremendous interest associated with, um, uh, with, with replacing polyurethane uh, crosslink materials uh, because um, they're made with uh, isocyanates, which are quite toxic, and the and the uh, uh, precursor for isocyanates is phosgene, which uh, um, is is extremely toxic. It uh, was used as a nerve gas in uh, in World War One. So, um, um, so, so there uh, are are uh, I think a lot of good opportunities in this particular area. And for me, it it is exciting. I've been a faculty member for a long time, probably longer than some of the audience members have been alive. And at this point in my career, I would like to see something that we've worked on um, actually commercially applied. And the fact that they're, uh, that industry is very interested uh, in this area actually makes it um, something that um, uh, I think is, is, is highly uh, likely to happen, if not for me, then for someone else, uh, actually in the next few years. Great. And then uh, our next question is uh, from Priyanchi, and they want to know, does extent of curing affect reprocessability of material um yes it yes it can and so uh, in some cases some materials um i would i would say are grudgingly reprocessable so so if you take polyurethane itself made from isocyanates and uh, um, um and amines uh, those are cases where if you run the reaction at stoichiometric balance, which should be, allow you to go to very high extensive reaction, the materials really don't quite get there in terms of reprocessability. Um, but if you go off stoichiometric balance, you can actually get them to reprocess well, but it does mean then that, that you have some unreacted functional groups uh, present uh, in those particular cases. Um, and so so that that can be a circumstance there. Um, I think uh, in terms of these cases with the sort of strictly dissociative dynamic chemistry that I talked about in particular here, I think we uh, see um, really uh, excellent reprocessability in these cases, even at very high extensive reaction. So you can go low or high and it, it, it doesn't really matter. Another question we have for you is, uh, are these polymers coming from fossil fuels or plants? Um, so they can come from both. And as I said, we have published some work um, which was strictly bio-based. Um, we've published, we are writing up some work at the present time where it's strictly non-food bio-based. And I think one of the, the lessons in this in this past year, maybe if, if anything from the Ukraine war, is that you don't want to end up doing things that might cause problems for uh, food to become uh, to become more expensive. So, so we think um, being bio-based is good, but we want to be non-food bio-based in terms of using things that won't end up increasing the cost for people there. But even if it's a circumstance where the materials might not be bio-based, if the materials can be reused effectively 10 times, um, you've done a tremendous amount in terms of reducing the need uh, for petroleum-based materials. 
the other question is uh, the re the reprocessing was conducted with compression molding. Can it also be processed using more conventional processing methods? Yes, so that's that's part of what we are trying to to work on at several levels. And as I had indicated before, we have uh, actually sent graduate students uh, to uh, company research locations to to actually try to do some research along those lines. And we are working on making uh, really s small modifications on on these dynamic crosslinker molecules so that they will uh, dissociate um, more uh, significantly at lower temperature um, uh, and uh, and where the materials then will actually flow, but then we'll also recover crosslink density uh, upon cooling. And so I, I um, we, we, we are in the midst of a study right now that, that so far appears to be quite promising. And um, and so we may have um, some, something more to to talk about in Trumpet in the in the next few months. But I think that is an extremely important uh, point here. Much of the work has been done, um, or almost all of the work that has been published has been done in terms of compression molding and sort of very, very slow reprocessing. And commercially, it's going to have to be done at, at considerably higher rates. And if it can be done continuously, 24 hours a day, that can be highly economically feasible. Great. All right, Dr. Nick, back to you and back to the pecan or as some might say, pecan. Um, the, uh, it's just a comment, but I wonder if you want to uh, comment on the comment, which is 80-degree um, cure and long outlife actually sounds amazing. Uh, do you want to elaborate on that at all or acknowledge that? I mean, thank you for the comment. I might have shared that comment with my uh, technician who's also on the call because uh, we were very excited about it uh, on that one. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's always a balance of things when it comes to manufacturing, right? Um, I think it is a value proposition here and we really want it to be one, but you also have to consider like, and I might not have elucidated as much, like the cure times are a little longer, honestly, not that much longer, but in industry where turnover is key, right. And how many parts you can make, uh, and CapEx dominates, you know, it could be a, uh, takeaway, but I think it's a benefit, especially when you start thinking about things like carbon fiber prepregs and, other things that we might get uh, benefits here as well. So yeah, let's stay with you then. Uh, is it bio-based? Is it commercially available? So kind of two questions in one question. Uh, which one? The APA or APA? Yeah, yeah. It's not commercially available. Uh, it is bio-based. I think there's still a lot of uh, metabolic engineering uh, that could go into that. But yeah, so it is bio-based. Um, still needs a lot of, a lot of bio-based chemicals still need to be scaled up right and maybe the i saw it in the chat so i'm going to use this opportunity to do a two for one you know someone asked about the question of like hey polyamides are really expensive such as these ones that are based off castor oil and to some extent it's supply and demand right uh, when you're starting to think about these like is there that supply and demand driving these things to be commercially available yet with 4-APA, like, I think once we get that publication out, that's going to be one of the first records of it. So I don't think there's much of a drive there. But then it's also what catalytic conversion routes you uh, use. A lot of the nylons that are made from castor oil-based uh, precursors use uh, our catalytic conversion, if you will, uh, our chemical catalytic conversion of castor oil. And castor oil is a small feedstock that is harder and harder to get. Versus as, you know, John was talking about some of these feedstocks like lignin and hemicellulose, we have bigger feedstocks and you just have to make sure it's non-food competitive as well. So I think there's this whole, there's a lot that even, you know, experts outside of myself and John could talk about, about how these supply chains have to work and what you need to target. Bio-based chemicals can be cheaper than their petrochemical components. A lot of things can be cheaper than some basic acid, but you need to establish the supply chains for that as well. So, and just honestly, the production volume, right? If yeah. people know you're going to pay that much for castor oils derived basic acid, then they're going to keep leveraging it. Our next question is, can CFRCs be mixed in the recycling stream? Ah, I love this question. So, uh, and I was thinking about this question when John was talking about some of the elastomers and the rubbers. I think there is such an opportunity to redesign thermosets 
such as elastomers, such as rigid uh, composites, such as CFRCs, because you don't need to put them into the single stream recycling, right? Like we're making CFRCs for a vehicle's application. So we're really hoping no one's going to rip their car panel off when it's broken and go toss it in the recycling bin. But there are vehicle, you know, we take cars to junkyards. So there's almost, you can get single stream recycling with vehicles. And so that's what we think is the big promise of these CFRCs is that if you can get them into the vehicles industry, there's a lot of incentive already within the vehicles industry to reclaim parts from previous cars or previous vehicles and reuse them for multiple lives. So you can have a natural built-in infrastructure. Same thing goes, I did not talk about elastomers. I'm very excited about elastomers. They are used more than rigid composites. I think as a field, we should be doing more and more work in elastomers. Uh, but when you look at elastomers, like I had a tire pop the other day, I went to the tire store and it got reclaimed, right? There mm -hmm. actually are already streams that exist uh, for the collection of these materials. So really they're the perfect materials to be redesigned for recycling or so on and so forth. So they don't exist in mixed stream recycling, but there's the perfect opportunity that's there, especially in the vehicle space, in my opinion. Well, great answer. Again, I want to thank everybody for attending our webinar today. Uh, this has been so fascinating and interesting. And I also want to thank our presenters who did masterful jobs today, Professor John Torkelson and Dr. Nicholas Rohr. Um, if you've registered to be here today, that's how you got here. Um, we did record today's uh, webinar. So you do have access to it and you will get a link in your email, which will provide um, certification for attending. And then you'll also have slides that you can go back in and watch the presentation if you want to take some additional notes or have some additional questions. Um, but I think on that note, we'll wrap it all up again. Thank you for attending. Thank you to presenters. And um, on behalf of TA Instruments, I want to thank you for coming today. And I hope to see you again soon. And until next time, I'm your host, Gene Gates, wishing you health and happiness.